through a, a yeah. mixed yeah. emotions yeah. right now. And I'm, it's kind of difficult for me to just pinpoint yeah. one emotion that, yeah, there's you been, know, um, right now I'm a little bit of, I'm a little, I'm a little, and, and I'm a little anxious to see what these dogs are going to pick up the scent again and take it. Um. Mary Denise Marshall Lands was born September 3rd, 1964, to parents Cliff and Anita Marshall. She was described as reserved and laid back, but sweet and easy to get along with, and also a loving mother. At the age of 39, Mary was a divorced mother of two children, ages 15 and 20, and was looking forward to becoming a grandmother in a few months. Mary was living with her fiancé, Christopher Luke Pratt, and also worked at a doctor's office in the billing department. The couple were living in the vicinity of the 1200 block of Orm Street in the small town of Marshall, Michigan. Unfortunately, her fiancé Pratt had a history of domestic violence, not only Mary, but also his first wife and previous girlfriends. He was very controlling of Mary and had convinced her to move far away from her friends and family. She had even told her co-workers that he dictated how much time she spent with her own children. Due to the controlling nature of Pratt, Mary's 15-year-old daughter would leave the home and move back in with her father. Also, Mary had at least once been to the emergency room from an alleged attack by Pratt. Then, during the late evening of March 12, 2004, Mary up and vanished, strangely leaving behind all her belongings, including her cell phone and keys. Days later, Pratt notified her parents in California that she never returned and her brother reported her missing. Once Pratt was questioned, he claimed he and Mary had a big argument and she told him she was going for a walk around 10 p.m. and simply never returned. Dogs tracked Mary's scent to a nearby motel after her disappearance, but it did not lead to her whereabouts. Um, this is my fiance, Mary Lands. Her age is 39. She's been missing since Friday, approximately between 10 and 11, let's say 10.30. Um, she took a walk, and we haven't seen her since. Um, they've tracked her throughout the Marshall area to different establishments um, in this area across the street and across town. And um, we believe she's out there somewhere, and uh, we will find her. Since Mary's disappearance, Pratt remains a person of interest and has left a trail of crimes, putting him behind bars. In 2007, he was found guilty of domestic violence, felonious assault, interfering with a communications device, and unlawful imprisonment of another woman, but released after six and a half years. Then, in late 2018, Pratt was once again arrested, but this time was for the alleged sexual assault of a teenager and charged with third-degree criminal sexual conduct. Her parents had no idea that she was a victim of domestic violence until after she went missing and medical records were released regarding significant injuries. The family created a petition on change.org seeking the FBI to investigate the possible corruption of certain officers working for the Marshall Police Department in 2004. I will put a link to the petition in the description below. According to her family, much of the evidence collected by law enforcement was later lost not only once, but twice. Also, they claim that a day and a half after she was last seen, and before her family knew she was missing, Pratt had received a call from the captain of the local police department for reasons unknown. Strangely, the brown leather jacket she was supposedly wearing when she took off walking was sold by Pratt at a flea market just a few months later. As of July 2022, Mary has never been found, and this case remains unsolved. Okay. We're done. See y'all cut. <laughs> Navea Amaya Buchanan was born on February 3, 2004, to parents Jennifer Buchanan and Shane Hinojosa in Monroe, Michigan. She was described as a tomboy with a beautiful smile who loved motorcycles. At the age of five, Navea lived in an apartment in the Charlotte Orms complex with her mother Jennifer and her grandmother and legal guardian, Sherry Buchanan. 
Nevaeh's father lived in Toledo, Ohio, and had not spoken to his daughter in nearly three years. Nevaeh's grandmother, Sherry, had become her legal guardian when her mother had spent several months in jail after being convicted of a home invasion and was on probation. On May 24, 2009, Nevaeh was in and out of her apartment playing with other children in the complex. Around 6.30 p.m., Nevaeh told her mother that she was going to play with a friend upstairs in the same unit where they lived, but instead she went outside on her scooter. When it was time for dinner, a child told Jennifer about Nevaeh playing on the scooter. Jennifer then began searching for her around 7 p.m. and discovered her scooter at the edge of the driveway, but no sign of Nevaeh. After an hour of searching, she frantically called 911 and a search quickly ensued by authorities with a K-9 unit and helicopters, foot patrol, and volunteers eager to help. A nearby quarry was also searched by divers and sonar equipment, but nothing was found. All 180 apartments of the complex were searched and residents questioned. The only possible witness was Tim Finley, who had visited his sister at the complex. He left the apartments around 7 p.m. and said he hadn't noticed any children playing outside, but did see a little red car speed out of the complex parking lot. His sighting was the only one that came up during the investigation. No other sighting of a red car or Nevea were reported. Hours later, around 12.30 a.m., an Amber Alert was issued. Convicted sex offenders George Kennedy and Roy Lee Smith were arrested for possible involvement in her disappearance. Rumors swirled that Jennifer and Kennedy were romantically involved, but she denied the rumors. However, she did state that Nevaeh did look at Kennedy like a father figure and called him Daddy George. Jennifer was introduced to Smith through Kennedy and was well aware that they were sex offenders. Kennedy had been in prison for sexually assaulting a 15-year-old girl and accosting a 13-year-old girl after invading her home. He was released in 2007, just two years before Nevaeh was abducted. Despite this, she apparently had no issue with them being close to her young daughter. With a search warrant, police searched the motel and van where Kennedy lived and found a towel and a sharp tool with blood on it, along with photos of young girls. Smith had been released just a year prior after serving 15 years for sexual assault. Both men were arrested for violating their probation by being around a child, but were never officially named suspects in Nevaeh's disappearance, and no hard evidence could link them. The blood on the items did not match Nevaeh's, and authorities stated that neither man were suspects. During her disappearance, her father, Shane, arrived from Ohio to assist in the search for his daughter despite a warrant for his arrest for failure to pay child support since becoming unemployed. On June 4, 2009, 10 days after Nevaeh disappeared, two fishermen, Guy Bickley and his stepson, were at the River Raisin Riverbank near Dixon Road and came upon a concrete block on the rocks. Thinking nothing of it, they walked over the concrete until an odor alerted them, which at first they thought was rotten fish. As they got a closer look and had kicked a piece that fell off, they made the horrible discovery of a small body and quickly called police. The location of the body was about 10 miles from the Charlotte Arms Apartments. Since the cement had not been properly mixed, it resulted in it easily chipping and crumbling and her body floating to the surface of the cement, revealing an imprint of her little body. Had the cement been properly mixed, she likely would have never been found. The autopsy revealed that Nevaeh had died of asphyxiation with dirt inhalation and her manner of death was homicide. The autopsy report did not mention if sexual abuse had occurred or not, but some reports state that brown carpet fibers were found on her body. Because of Nevaeh's love for motorcycles, nine officers on motorcycles led her to her final resting place while her hearse was pulled by Harley Davidson, her favorite kind of motorcycle. Another 60 motorcycles followed behind and hundreds of people attended her funeral. Interestingly, George Kennedy, previously mentioned, often worked with cement and a cement company stood right behind the motel where Kennedy lived. 
However, no evidence was found to suggest his or Smith's involvement in Nevaeh's murder. When asked by Nancy Grace why she allowed the known sex offenders to interact so closely with her daughter, she responded that she believes everyone deserves a second chance. At Jennifer Buchanan, Liz, could you roll that video after a few tough questions about exposing her child to a sex offender. This is what she and her good friend Holly Howerton decided to do. Rather than take your calls about her conduct live, this is their response. Police then shifted their focus to a third man, James Easter. After being questioned by police, Easter suspiciously quickly built a fire in his backyard and was later charged with arson, which made him become a person of interest. Police also were looking for a green minivan that was seen at the Hollywood School at the time of Nevaeh's abduction. They were also looking for two young boys aged 7 to 10 to question if they had seen anything strange regarding the green minivan at the school while they were playing at the playground near the apartment complex. A woman later reported seeing a black car that stood out at the apartment parking lot the day before and the day of Nevaeh's abduction. According to an article, police received a complaint the day before the abduction located about three miles away from Charlotte Orms in Greenwick Commons about a man driving a black Grand Prix who had revealed his genitals to two children. The man was allegedly reported to be Paul Miller Jr. Investigators interviewed Miller's parents, who stated that their son was a friend of Roy Lee Smith, who drove a black car and often went fishing in various places around Monroe. Miller eventually pleaded guilty to obscene acts, but was never connected to Nevaeh's murder. In 2014, a Monroe local paper revealed that police believe an unnamed man born and raised in Monroe that was in prison in 2014 for domestic abuse charges was a person of interest in Nevaeh's murder but did not have enough evidence to convict him or press charges but knew enough to state that he had not planned to abduct her. Some of her family members believe that her mother knows more than she's saying. Her grandmother says that whoever took and killed her probably knew her because no one heard any screams and she wouldn't approach a stranger. Hundreds of tips have been provided to law enforcement and investigated, but as of July 2022, this case remains unsolved. Lisa Marie Knight was born September 12, 1982 to parents Mark and Jean Knight. She was described as easygoing and enjoyed horses and the country life, but she was also the life of the party and a spitfire. At the age of 29, Lisa was a mother of four living in Osinagi, Michigan, and was divorced from her ex-husband, Lloyd Frey. However, on the night of June 8, 2012, she was at the home of Frey, and for unknown reasons, she called a friend and sounded very upset and asked to be picked up because she didn't have a vehicle. Lisa never stated what was wrong, but her friend was unable to pick her up, but did notify her father, who was out of town for work, of the alarming phone call, who quickly headed for home. Lisa has never been seen or heard from since, and was reported missing four days later. No one could get in touch with her, and her cell phone hasn't been used since that night. When authorities interviewed Frey, he stated that when he went to bed, Lisa was there and must have left sometime after he went to sleep. Authorities initially believed she left of her own accord and was just on a bender somewhere as she had a history of drug use, but later they changed their suspicions to foul play. Authorities believe that someone they have already interviewed is likely involved in her disappearance and presumed homicide. Frey, who is the father of two of her children, is a person of interest in her case, but he has apparently cooperated with police. He even gave them permission to search his property. However, he strangely poured concrete on his property not long after she went missing. Law enforcement bored holes in the concrete, searching for her body, but nothing was found. Also, they brought in cadaver dogs and state crime lab personnel, but no signs of Lisa was found. Her many loved ones remained devastated and continued to search for answers as to where Lisa could be. 
They admit that they understand Lisa is likely not walking this earth any longer, but wants someone to provide the information that leads to her discovery and answers to what happened. But as of July 2022, this case remains unsolved. Jasmine Sharia Moody was born on January 1, 1996, and is originally from Arkansas. She was described as very social and energetic. Jasmine later located to Texas and graduated O.D. Wyatt High School in Fort Worth. At the age of 18, Jasmine was a freshman at Texas Women's University studying to become a nurse and was earning straight A's. She had wanted to become a nurse since she was 16 years old. She was also involved in the ROTC program and dance. In 2014, she met Brittany Gurley on social media, who lived in Detroit, Michigan, and the two became close. That Thanksgiving break, she planned to visit Brittany and her family in Detroit and flew there on November 25, 2014. Over a week later, on December 4, while still in Detroit, the two women got into a heated argument about Jasmine being on social media and Brittany demanding to look at her laptop. Brittany's family reported that Jasmine stormed out of their home, located in the 3700 block of Baldwin Street, in the area of Van Dyke and Mack Avenue at 7.30 p.m. She allegedly left everything behind, including her ID, purse, and coat, and supposedly walked away into freezing temperatures with a windshield below zero degrees. Also, Jasmine was unfamiliar with the area, which also happened to be a high-crime neighborhood. When she allegedly started walking, Brittany also went for a walk to grab a cigarette. When Jasmine didn't return, Brittany and her mother went searching for her for 15 minutes before reporting her missing. She was scheduled to return to Texas on a mega bus the next morning to return to classes on December 7th, but never returned. The extent of their relationship is unclear because Jasmine's mother says it was only a platonic friendship, but police believe the couple may have been romantically involved. Jasmine's family also believes that Brittany knows more about her disappearance than she has told. She allegedly was hospitalized following the incident for anxiety and other issues, and their home was thoroughly searched. About nine months after she went missing, Jasmine's parents turned to a private investigator for help in their search. He joined many interviews and searches and admits that it is possible that she was snatched off the streets in that neighborhood, but the story could also be a cover-up. Many police cadets and volunteers spent days searching abandoned houses in the area where she went missing, but as of July 2022, Jasmine remains missing and this case remains unsolved. Glenn Richard Huston Jr. was born to parents Jules and Barbara Sanford. He was born mentally disabled on April 28, 1970 and nicknamed Lenny. People who knew him described him as a social, happy person who would help anyone in need. He loved his three cats, his job, country music, and taped every episode of the Dukes of Hazard show. At the age of 30, he was employed at the Fulton Country Corners gas station and lived in an apartment in the 100 block of Caroline Street in Middleton, Michigan. He always rode his bicycle to and from work and parked it on the side of the building. On February 5, 2001, his bicycle went missing and a female co-worker said she gave him a ride home. He never showed back up to work the next day and has never been seen since. His family reported him missing on February 11, six days after he was last seen. Lenny had been planning to move out of his apartment prior to his disappearance because of an issue with his landlord. When investigators searched his apartment, they didn't find any evidence of foul play, but they did find his clean laundry sitting by the door. Two weeks later, on February 20, 2001, his bicycle, a blue girl's model with a wire basket on the front, was discovered abandoned next to a trucking company warehouse in Ithaca, Michigan. Lenny was scheduled to testify in a preliminary hearing the next week after he went missing. 
His landlord, Roger Eugene Brown, was also his boss at the gas station where he was employed. Brown owned several rental properties in the Middleton area and allegedly took advantage of Lenny's mental capacity. Lenny was allegedly with Brown when he stole a rifle and a bow from another tenant's trailer a few months earlier in October of 2000. He initially told police that Brown had not taken anything from the property. Then he recanted that, and in a written statement, he said Brown had stolen the items because he was upset about the condition of the residence he was renting to a tenant and was behind on rent. An arrest warrant was issued for Brown on February 1st, four days before Lenny went missing. Lenny had also allegedly seen Brown assault a 10-year-old child in the apartment Lenny was living in. According to the sheriff's office, in October of 2000, three children ages 9, 10, and 11 were visiting Lenny when Brown came to his apartment, grabbed the 10-year-old boy by the front of his shirt collar, pushed him against a wall, and started hollering at him and accusing him of being in the apartment attic. He allegedly slapped the boy once and told the children to get out of the building and not come back. The boy's mother then filed a complaint against Brown. When authorities interviewed Lenny, he backed up the boy's story and said the three kids often came to his apartment and the boy had not been in the attic. Brown was ultimately charged with larceny of a firearm and assault, and if found guilty, he was facing up to five years in prison. According to police reports, Lenny was frightened that Brown would evict him or fire him. According to arrest records, Brown has a criminal record in Kalamazoo, Michigan, dating back to the 80s, and is currently on parole until January 2023. However, after Lenny went missing, the larceny charge against Brown was dismissed because he was the only eyewitness and prosecutors did not have enough evidence to proceed without his testimony. He pleaded guilty in the assault case and was issued a fine. Lenny's stepsister later tried to investigate her brother's disappearance and stated that she felt people were following her during that time. She said she received threats and someone even smashed her car windows. She eventually gave up after not finding anything and now believes her brother is dead. As of July 2022, Lenny has been missing for 21 years and this case remains unsolved. <laughs>